Welcome back, everyone. In chapter eight, we're going to learn about how to estimate single population parameters. But as always, let's first review the learning outcomes for the chapter. So in this video, we will discuss how to distinguish between a point estimate and a confidence interval estimate. We will also learn how to construct and interpret a confidence interval estimate for a single population mean using the standard distribution when the population standard deviation is known. And then to break up the 8.1 videos, we will then learn how to construct and interpret a confidence interval using the T distribution when the population standard deviation is not known. Then in the next two videos, we'll learn about calculating required sample sizes and build confidence intervals for a single population proportion. So that should cover it. So let's get started. So recall in previous chapters where we learned about the sample means and the sample proportions, these are known as point estimates in that we're using the sample data to estimate what's going on in the population. So here are some familiar symbols that we've seen consistently over the last couple chapters. We have mu for the population mean and x bar for the sample mean, and then lowercase p for the population proportion, and then p bar for the sample proportion. So if you recall in chapter 7 that we learned about the sampling error and that a statistic from a sample is subject to sampling error because it's not a perfect representation of our population and its parameters. So in this chapter, we're going to build on our point estimate by developing a confidence interval estimate around it. So for instance, the interval for the time it takes me to drive the campus could be between 35 and 45 minutes, depending on traffic or the day of the week. These intervals are based on a particular confidence level. Confidence interval estimate is the interval developed from a statistical sample such that if all possible intervals of a given width were constructed, a percentage of these intervals, known as the confidence level, would include the true population parameter. So we can see in the very middle is the point estimate from the sample, say my average commute time from a sample of the days that I drive the campus is 40 minutes. So the lower confidence limit is 35 minutes and the upper confidence limit is 45 minutes. So note that the distance from the sample mean to my lower and upper limits are the same, but how do we know what our lower and upper limits are? So let's jump into that topic now on calculating a confidence interval for when the population standard deviation is known. So the format of the confidence interval estimate is the point estimate plus or minus the critical value times the standard error. We have worked with these three pieces of information before, and now we're simply putting them together to create our confidence interval estimate. So the point estimate is the sample mean. This is something we have already learned how to calculate in prior chapters. We also learned about the standard error in chapter seven, which is the population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size n. So the critical value is the z-values that we also previously learned about as well. We are now linking these confidence levels in terms of percentages to their corresponding z-values. So here is a table with the most used confidence levels and the respective z-values. I'll show you how to find them in Excel, but since these are the most used ones, this is a quick reference table when we're asked for a particular confidence level with its corresponding z-value. Let's get a visual of how to interpret a confidence interval. So recall when we converted an X value into a Z value, it would give us the area from the middle out to a particular Z value. So for instance, the Z value of 1.96 covers 95% of our data. This is about two standard deviations on either side. So a 95% confidence interval tells us how confident we are that the true population parameter will fall within the interval. So let's check out some different confidence intervals. So in the first example, where I have a particular sample mean and my interval is a particular width, the true population mean will fall somewhere within this interval. So in the second sample mean, the point estimate is so far over to the left 
that we can see that our interval does not include the true population mean. So this one fell outside of our 95% confidence interval. Now in this third sample mean, the point estimate falls in the shade region and therefore the true population mean is captured within this interval. And then the same thing with the fourth sample. We can keep repeating this over and over with the different sample means and we'll find that 95% of them will include the true population mean. 5% will be outside in the two tails so therefore, that's why you see the 0 0.025 on either side of the halves. Let's check out an example. The distribution of hours worked by students at Miracosta College is normally distributed so we know it's bell-shaped. If the population standard deviation is known to be five hours, construct and interpret a 90% confidence interval estimate for the mean hours worked by all students in a random sample of 64 students has a mean equal to 23 hours. So plugging in the numbers from the story, the point estimate is given to us as a sample mean of 23 hours. The critical Z value is based on our 90% confidence interval estimate desired. So I'm gonna use my commonly used confidence levels and you can see at 90%, that's a Z critical value of 1.645. Then the population standard deviation is given to us at five hours and the sample size is given to us at 64. So next, I will plug the variables into this formula here. So you're gonna to wanna to solve everything to the right of the plus or minus sign. So the square root of 64 is eight, and five divided by eight is 0.625. So then 1.645 times 0.625 is 1.03. So we have 23 plus or minus 1.03. Then to get the confidence interval estimate, I will subtract the 1.03 from the sample mean of 23 to get the lower confidence limit of 21.97 hours. Then I'm gonna add the 1.03 to 23 to get the upper confidence limit of 24.03 hours. The sample mean is in the middle of the confidence interval and 21.97 and 24.03 are on either side of the interval. So based on our sample data with 90% confidence, we can conclude that the true population mean is somewhere between 21.97 hours and 24.03 hours. So in other words, because we're using a sample to estimate the true population mean, we wouldn't tell a decision maker an exact value. Instead, we would give them an estimate because we know that point estimates are prone to sampling error and we must account for this. Now, to the right of the plus or minus sign where we took the critical Z value times our standard error, this is known as the margin of error. So you may have heard of this term before, like with election polls, where pollsters will estimate how many people will vote for a candidate plus or minus the margin of error. The margin of error, as you can see in this visualization here, it's half of the interval. So in other words, the margin of error indicates that the sample mean of 23 hours is within 1.03 hours of our true population mean. So now what happens if we modify our confidence level, keeping the sample mean of 23 hours the same, the standard deviation of five and the sample size of 64 students the same. The only thing I'm changing is the confidence level which requires a different critical Z value. We just calculated the margin of error for a 90% confidence interval is 1.03. When we increase the confidence to 95%, the Z critical value increases to 1.96 and we get a wider interval. The same as when we go up to 99% confidence. As my confidence level increases, so does the margin of error because I'm making the interval wider and more confident the interval will include my population parameter. So what happens if we modify the sample size but keep the sample mean of 23 hours the same? A 90% confidence interval with a critical Z value of 1.645 the same, but we're changing our sample size from 64 to 100 to 144. You'll notice that the margin of error now gets smaller. Recall when we learned about the central limit theorem the bigger the sample, the closer we get to the true population mean and the curve becomes more narrow. So some things to note here is we're gonna have some conflicting objectives. 
So as a decision maker, as a decision maker, we want a small margin of error, meaning we want to be as close to the true population mean as possible. That allows us to make better decisions. But we also want to have high confidence because 99% is better than 80%, which means more of our intervals or our data falls within the range of our estimate. At the same time, we want a smaller sample size because in business, we have limited resources in terms of time and money to collect sample data. So we need to find the right balance between these three things. So before we walk through a practice problem, let's discuss how to use Excel to calculate our Z critical value and our margin of error. So alpha, which is denoted by the Greek letter A, simply means you're going to take one minus the confidence level. So for instance, if we're working with a 95% confidence level, we take one minus 0.95 and that will give us an alpha of 0.05. So to find a critical Z value, I would recommend using that reference table that I provided to you earlier, but if you wanna try it out in Excel, or if you ask for a percentage that's not in that commonly used table, say like 96%, then you would use this formula, which is using the norm.s.inv function, and then ABS means absolute value. So that will convert any negative number to a positive Z critical value. So for instance, if we wanna know the Z value for 95%, I'll type in this formula using the alpha of 0.05 we found earlier divided by two. This is because we have two tails on either side of the curve. And that will give me a Z value of 1.96. So as you saw before, this matches up to the Z value for a 95% confidence interval. Most confidence level examples will be in that reference table, but this function is handy to know. Now for our margin of error, rather than doing it by hand, you could use this formula while you're in alpha, the standard deviation given to you, and the sample size. So here's an example for a confidence level of 95%, a standard deviation of 55, and a sample size of 250. I'll plug in my values into the formula, and we get a margin of error of 6.82. Okay, let's wrap this up now with a practice problem. Here's problem 8-3, and we wanna construct a 95% confidence interval estimate for the population mean. So the first three steps here are just to identify the key information that was given to us in the story. We have the sample size, or little n, of 250. The desired confidence level is 95%. Finally, the sample mean was also given to us as 250. Now in step four, since 95% is a common confidence level and is included in our reference table, we know that our critical Z value is 1.96. Now, if you want to use Excel, here is the formula again, but, but don't forget to divide alpha of 0.05 by two to get the Z value. The last step five is to compute the confidence interval estimate. So here is the formula again, where we'll take the sample mean, then plus or minus the Z critical value times the standard error. Let's first calculate the standard error, which is 55 for the population standard deviation divided by the square root of 250 or the sample size. So this gets us 3.479. Then we multiply by the Z critical value of 1.96 and we get 6.82. Again, if you wanna use Excel, Here's the formula using the confidence.norm function. Finally, we will add and subtract 6.82 or the margin of error from the sample mean of 300. And we get a confidence interval estimate between 293.18 and 306.82. And we're 95% confidence that our true population mean is somewhere between this interval. Okay, that wraps up this first part on point estimates and confidence intervals when the population standard deviation is known. So in the second part, we'll walk through this last topic, which is how we deal with the common situation that the population standard deviation is not known.